when how I started, my father was, and grandfather, and I'll be frank to me, were all bricklayers. Bricklayers, stonemasons, what have you. And at the age of uh, 15, I started serving my time here in town. My father had, was after getting old that there was a vacancy in John Sisk for an apprentice. So that's how I started like as an apprentice in John Sisk. My great-grandfather, he was the former mason and the, the old courthouse, or the present, the, the other one was burnt, was in the present courthouse. He was the general foreman, and that was Sam Hill, the builder of Cork. And my grandfather then worked all over the place. He was in Middleton. And uh, myself then I started with Sisk. I was 33 years with him. Well, the whole lot started actually was my father. Uh, father was a stonemason bricklayer his whole life, and his grandfather and his father and generations of Murphys were stonemasons and bricklayers. Well, I, I started in the, in the winter of 1953 in uh, Ballyfehan, like it's Connolly, in the building of Connolly Road and Pierce Road, you know, and all the, the off places there, like. And uh, my father was there at the time. I always remember that uh, I had no gear or nothing. And I, I started with uh, Albert Rovers football stockings because I was stuck in the, the Albert Rovers team at the time. And, uh, and a pair of uh, light shoes in the middle of winter, I always remember it. I was born in 1935. I uh, started work in 1947, uh, right? The, uh, and I was long out of school. I had to do me, 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 me intercert. My father was a mason. So the, uh, I suppose it was only natural that I would follow on in his footsteps and I belonged to him with Mason before him. Uh, well, I started with my father as an apprentice and uh, it was uh, a crow called Poor Price. There were uh, Crowleys over in, uh, over in uh, South Terrace. I got into trade through my father got a sword and I was a fourth generation of Masons and I was apprenticed in 1949, September 1949. Yeah, yeah well I, I started off, I'd be like the rest of my brothers there, I started off there when I was uh, in, in 1961. I started with my father as well there above in, in uh, Spangle Hill, it's known as Farnley now. As an apprentice there with my father for a while, but he was he was in charge of the site above. I started when I was about 15 years of age, right? And I worked in Valley Fihan and it's the first scheme that was out there. And I was an apprentice there. Well, I started to serve my time with my father in 1863, the year that President Kennedy came to Ireland. I started my apprenticeship in, on the, 10th, the 20th of August, 1945. I was bound to my father, who was also a mason, as well as his, his father before him and his grandfather before that. It was the done thing you'd follow in in the, in the footsteps of your, uh, in your father in that trade. But that time, it's not the same as now. Like, your, your father had to be a mason before you were a mason, you know? And to a kind of family, all families. They were like the Falvies, the O'Maras, the Fahis, the Harringtons. So long as you get to know one of them, in very short time you get to know them all, you know? Oh, my father, my father and my uh, my family, my uncles, they were mostly all Masons, like, you know? And, uh, my father, my grandfather, great-grandfather, back along, I'd say, as long as our family can remember anyway, even my my uncle, Billy Madden, he was 85 years old when he died, and he was telling me about his great-grandfather. My great-grandfather, going back to my great-grandfather, they all belonged to him. They were all, they were mostly all stone masons. My father was a bit of easy, he block there and stone there, he'd done every kind of thing. Down through the years, we've all been masons. We've never done any other work on the masonry. Dennis, no one myself, my father, his father's brother, to me, he had three sons, Connie, Christy, and Teddy Masons. And then he had a son, Michael Murphy, as a Mason at the time. So that's how we come over. That's how we have four generations of Masons and Bricklayers, of course.
there might be five or six of them there and it was very seldom any of the rest of the family done anything else if their father was a mason bricklayer they were the same yeah when you weren't if you weren't doing too well at school yeah, she said, he'll be a mason anyway because the count of the father being a mason you automatically got an apprenticeship well of course your, your father suggested like would you be interested in the way to it you see but you had very little choice at that time and those years? It was uh, one day, one day he, he, he came home and uh, I saw, he said, me and my mother were, were chatting away and I said, no, he kind of said to myself, there's something going on here, you see, and uh, the, uh, uh, he, he turned to me, he said, to see, he said, this one at Torsley, I think, to see the, uh, you're going to work, he said, on the morning. I said, where am I going to work? He said, you'll come to work with me, he said, to serve your time, he said, as a, as a mason. The, uh, to see you and uh, I'm after getting in overalls for you. It was all I ever wanted to do because my dad was a great tradesman and my grandfather and as Joe said, like you know, all of our family right down his, uh, my grand uncle, which would have been Joe for his uh, father, he was a gentleman. Uh, he, I'd say he was no, no higher than that, like you know, half the ground and he always smoked a woodbine. I, I think it was a woodbine and he was, he was one of these fellas that the woodbine wouldn't leave the lip until the other one was lit and ready to go in. You know, and such was a constant butt about that lint hanging off the fag. We got, we got good training from my father and a lot of the other good masons that were around. And we learned our trade and we passed it on ourselves. I had a lot of, a, a lot of apprentices myself down through the years in different sites. And uh, I trained them in well. I gave them the experience I got. I passed it on to those. Anyone that had a flair for the mason, the mason of bricklaying or stone laying, for that matter, if they had a flair, they couldn't come into the trade because their father wasn't a mason. They could go away and be a doctor, but they couldn't be a mason. And, um, you know, any time that you'd go for a job after that, the first thing, like, if you went in, you'd say, you know, I remember going to the North Chapel as an apprentice, uh, Eddie O'Brien worked down below there and, um, uh, you know, uh, there was a man there, Tommy Hurley, Tommy Woodbine. Uh, he was the foreman bricklayer there and I remember going in there and, um, you know, uh, asking about, you know, for a job. I said, uh, Mr Hurley, are you looking for any masons? And he said, uh, what's your name? And I said, uh, Falvey. And which one of the Falveys are you? Who's your father? And I said, my father's the black one. So uh, there was a load of Falveys there. Most of them had nicknames. Like there, there was a lot of, as, it, as they say, Timmies and Paddies and Jimmies and, 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 and there'd, there'd be Falvies there, there'd be so many Falvies, Fahies, Maddens, as he said, the O'Briens and so on, and the Joneses and the, like that, you'd, you'd have to know when you come onto the site, there, there, could be, there could be three or four different sets of Falvies in there and they'd, they'd have to know, like, who's son of you? Jim Madden was the shark anyway, uh, Taki Sullivan was Paddy Sullivan. We had Gangster Murray, he spent a few years in America, and when he came home we called him Gangster. And then there was, the, there was another fellow, he was called uh, Charlie Chaplin, because he sort of walked maybe a little like Charlie Chaplin. The Pie Ball was there, that was Dan Jones's brother. Billy, he was a foxy fellow, so we called him the Pie Ball. And we called Dan, Dan the Juno, no, we just called him the Pony, and his father was the Horse. So we christened him well, but over the priest, you know. And they called my father the black up because he was very, very dark. Uh, he had a brother that was very fair and they called him the whiter. There was another fellow who was beyond about his teeth being so white and they called him the pearls because he said his, his, his teeth were like pearls. And then the, the youngest fellow, Mikey, his name, uh, he, they called him the pilot because he had done a stunt with the RAF. So like the four brothers were the black or the white or the pearl and the pilot. There was a uh, Paddy Nason then and Tommy Nason. Paddy was uh, Colonel Springsprung and Tommy was Colonel Ironsides. My own sons called me Jock, like at the time they the 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 Ewing's Jock Ewing used to be on the telly and they used to always be mocking me about it, like we're going to call you Jock Ewing, you know. Tommy Hurley then they used to call him Hamford Jam. He always said jam in his lunch. He must have his wife must have worked in the jam factory. And then he'd come in the morning, what have you in your lunch, Marco? When to come to tea time, oh, I have a bit of ham. I'll give you a jam for ham. And that stuck to him, you know. My grandfather, um, old Dan, they used to call him Steady Stroke 
because he'd go into work every day and he had the same old pace all day long, you know. No no burst of speed, no nothing, but at the end of the day, he had a fair day's work done. There was a man called Jim Bryan. He was the gum. He was known as the gum. And the reason he was known as the gum, he was the most educated man you ever met in your life. There was another man there called the Bishop, or John Delaney. This man Delaney, and he had an apprentice with him. And with that while he was plumbing, and next, the plumb up fell off down onto the scaffold, and the, print, the apprentice walked over the course, with respect for the man that he was working with, and bent down for to pick up the plumb bob to give it to your man. But he was still facing the wall, and with that because when the apprentice was coming up, some smart ass, looking around, he said, Look, look at your man, he's kissing the bishop's ring. That's the sure as God is judge. That's what they, straight away, like, you know, that was cock wit, really, like, you know. For me to go on to a site in those days, I'd, I'd have to, they'd say, what fell for you? And I'd say, look, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the blacker son. You, you're, you're the young blacker. So, like, all, all our family, you know, Timmy and Jimmy and Donnie and the rest of them, uh, and you, we, and big family of us there, as they say, and we'd be known on that site as the, the blacker sons. No, so we'd be known as the young blackers. So. But Jerry, then he was called bored and drunk. He'd come along and he'd give up the drink. He'd have a new suit, shoes, grand shoes and everything, a ring on his finger, all decked up. He'd go in and he'd get the hair all dyed blonde. That's a fact, all waves and everything. And then that raving trust would come on in. And then he'd be on the building line, he'd sell his coat, he'd sell the shoes. If you had a broken pair of shoes, not an old pair, he said, what size are they? Size eight, bro. Their size eight, too. Give me a half, give me a half dollar, two and sixpence, and he switched shoes. You had Talky Sullivan, which was, you know, for obvious reasons, we all know why they called him Talky. He was not as good as myself, I suppose. If I was in the building late today, they might call me the Bob of Philae. <laughs> 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 I left school fairly young, all right. I was only about 14 or something, I left school. I started off and I realised after uh, about six months, like, you know, that if I wanted to make something of myself that I wasn't going to make it without, uh, like, I had no um, uh, theory work of building or anything else like that, so I had to go back and went to night school first and, and uh, half a tech. And I'd done uh, five years there, it cost me ten euros, ten, ten shillings, the old children know it, for uh, my first year. When I went to work first then, I had to be brought into the Mason Union and I had to be bound by the society and I was bound by my father at the time. Every Mason going in at that time did always be bound to somebody and that person then would be, I suppose, responsible for you while you were learning your trade and you had to have the greatest respect for any all other tradesmen. You had to have the greatest respect. There was no messing on, none of that carry on at all. You were there to learn the trade, and that's what you had to do. Well, uh, like, oh, for a good few years, like, they were the bosses, like, you'd, do a, you'd have to do what they told you, you know, and they'd show you, of course, like, how to bend the blocks and how to join the blocks, and uh, they were all very helpful. All, all, uh, all the fellas were very helpful with the apprentices, I must certainly say. But in the meantime, then I started my apprenticeship, uh, that was in 1976, and uh, I remember my grandfather coming up to me, and he said, no, Jimmy says, um, I don't think you should go into the trade at all. He said, it's, it's a very hard job, he says, uh, and, you know, you, you'll never be rich over, he said. Uh, but uh, I had my heart set in it. At that time, it was, it was seven years apprenticeship. You had plenty of time to, uh, to learn your trade. I left school when I was, say, 15. I done like like him there. I done five years over in the Crawford Tech, steady and building, and uh, mainly theory. Uh, drawing plans and uh, like Humphrey said there will go what you draw one week you'd build another week and that's the way you, you proceed with your five years there and your seven years um, apprenticeship which meant that by the time that that was up you had a fairly good knowledge of what you were doing. I served my time at, at just gone 13 and I think most of my brothers did and most of them, I think every every one of them that started, they all started with my father. When I was serving my time, I was an apprentice, we just take friends. 
I'd be with, we'd send out a five was with my father and we were doing brickwork. And then we just say, for instance, that we say, Confahi, then we say that he was the job where they were stonework. But I'd be with my father and we'd say, maybe a couple of months. And then he'd, he'd meet Con then and Con would say, my young fellow could do the bit of brickwork. And the shark might say to him then, and my fellow could do them in a bit of stonework. So they'd switch the apprentices over, you know? Like, if I was making a mistake, like he pulled me aside and he said, Oh, Jim, no, he says, this is the way you do it. And... But me dad, oh, he was a cranky bastard. Oh, God, he broke me melt. And he... <clears throat> He used to, like, you know, he used to look for faults, as the man would say. No, I suppose what he was doing was making sure that I did things right, you know. He showed no favouritism, as the man would say. When you were an apprentice, you were expected to do a lot of things like that you probably, you, you wouldn't be asked to do now today. You were like, do pipe laying, block laying, brick laying. Every two masons had only one apprentice. So therefore, the, the, the two of them would be teaching you what one fellow would may, maybe fail to tell you, the other fellow wouldn't, you know. Frankie Harrington, right, he would insist that when you laid every every course of bricks that you laid, right, you uh, spray water on it, or if it can, right, for the next one. No, it was a great, it was a great method because Jesus, when the one, once the martyrs got, got onto the wet bricks after that, Jesus, you couldn't get them apart, but the... Uh, Jimmy Welsh then, the Bronco, he didn't want no water. Oh, Christ, keep the water away from him, you see. And here I was, and I could only wet half the wall, and I couldn't wet the other half. <laughs> and I was saying, what am I allowed to let myself into here? I used to make the tea for him now when I started first. You go down there, the, the no flask that time, you go down with the billy can with the tea and sugar, and uh, you go down to the to the hut where they had a big boiler. And no matter if they make the tea in the billy cans, maybe for about, you know, six or eight of them. You'd hardly talk when you'd be an apprentice. It would come to tea time. The apprentices were going to one house and the men were going to the other house. And under no circumstances could the apprentice go and have to stay with the men. And you always called the man sir or mister. You never called him by his name unless he told you for to. But otherwise you didn't, you know. You had that respect for him, like. Anything that's not done right, you know, when you'd be serving your time, of course, like, you'd be mad for the little burst of speed and... Then when he'd look, if he'd said, no, every course of blocks, he'd look and he'd say, listen, you're going to hide there or ski that down or look, that, that's what I want to do, take that down. And of course, when it comes down once or twice, you won't be long getting the idea, you're not so as fast as what you thought because what you have up had to come down and you will be made to do it again. The old mates, as I say, they were very strict in the way they do it right. They give in a bit of casting knuckles with the troll. What the hell do you think you're doing, you know? <laughs> That's not the way to do it. You know, you're doing it the wrong way. They, they would let you use the trowel for a while, the, the old masons, like, uh, it sometimes it would take you like a year to let you use the trowel because um, they wanted to make sure you're doing a lot of cut and chases in the walls and stuff like that. But my main specialty, actually, I, I was allowed into a little bit of stone, but mostly brick. Uh, in America, it was mostly, uh, did some stonework in Cork, all right, but it was mostly brick. But my, going back to my father, uh, Timmy would probably laugh at this now, but uh, he used to always say, you know, if you were cutting something or, you know, and, and if you were finding it hard as a young lad to cut it, he'd say, listen, come out of the way by and don't be tormenting it. That was a saying, like, you're already tormenting that. Show me, give me that hammer and I'll fix it for you. At that time, you'd have to serve seven years of your trade. And they'd say, beyond the fourth year, and I actually was would be getting man's rate at the uh, fourth year because... They thought you were worth it and you were doing the, the work for it. So they were willing to give you the extra bit to be doing as much as a qualified man. I went to work in the Billy Payne scheme now. The flying saucer was there, didn't you, and he was the foreman. So he phoned out I was getting married and it was only apprentice wages for very small, didn't he? I didn't say, we can't have this. He says, we'll make a man over here. <laughs> so I was ordering my time at 18. So if anyone tells you, like, they had to sell seven years, to become a bricklayer, they must have been, they'd have been geniuses because I know enough after three and a half years to get, to, to get me through and all the rest of the lads with me. So all the apprentices at that time, even if they weren't working with their families, they came up through the ranks with people that had done this all their life for generations. 
But that time, that time, like you know, you you get a, you get a chance to do everything to see what you're good at. You know what I mean? Uh, some people could do a bit of everything. More people only wanted to do concentrate on doing one or two things. You know? It consisted of blocks, bricks, stone, tiling, paving, sores, wigging. There were so many things to be done. I done the stone work and I done the brick and I done the block work. I never, I was never totally into stone work. I was more brick, brick and block there. As you go along, you'll find other fellas now, like Jim for his father. I was very interested in what I was doing. And I was in there. Uh, which this stand it was very great. It was a great firm for the, the selection of work. You had brickwork and stonework and painting, and whereas the lads that where I was going to do it wrong that time, the all block work and housing and all that, you know. Well, I was mostly block work, like you know, block work was my uh, thing, like you know, and I used to do a lot of chasing, as they call it, that time for electricians, like in houses, for to put in their pipes, like you know, for to connect up their pipes, like I done a lot of that. Personally, I liked doing the stone, I liked doing the brick. It was something that you could, like with block work, it was covered over no matter how good or bad it was. Whereas with brick work and stone, you take a look and you say like, well, you know, that looks well now and, you know, you're kind of proud that you're after doing it. The, that time there was there was a kind of a, a kind of a snobbery attached to brick laying as against laying concrete blocks. The, uh, and uh, if you were able to lay the bricks into it, and everybody could lay bricks, you'd be surprised. But uh, the fellas that were able to able to lay the bricks, they kind of looked down on the, and the fellas that were, uh, that were only laying the concrete blocks. The, uh, and uh, we found both snobbery. Jesus was going back that far as well. Oh, well, I have to say, like, once you got into the stormwork, there was nothing like it. Because you could be out in the middle of the countryside on your own. And I think there was nothing better than it than to be there, with your thoughts, as the man would say. And it just the thing about stone, like, is that you could do anything with it if you took the time with it. And uh, like you could spend an hour, well, we'll say half an hour, dressing a piece of stone, and just on the last tap of the hammer, the whole thing was shattered on you, and you'd have to start all over again. You know, it was one of these jobs. It was time consuming. But it was great therapy if you were a bit mad. A lot of them were good at different things, you know. Every, at that time we were running everything, you know, the stonework, brickwork, block, whatever it was, the paving, tiling, all that. A lot of sores work. I done all the sores and the manhole was going through Bellyfee Hair that time. And uh, one day, well, they used to give me a bucket of stuff, actually, and I used to go into the pipes with the, the big, big pipes, like, you know, three foot bore. And I used to go into the pipes in with uh, a lamp and a bucket of stuff. And they come down every hour or so, or two hours, to give me another bucket of stuff. But one day, with the rain and everything else, so that would be down maybe 15 feet on the ground, you know? And all the blanks started caving in. And uh, I knew there was something wrong in it, but, you know, you'd hear the crashes inside. You'd be running up the pipe and down the pipe, you know, for all the crashes. But uh, the two manholes were filled in. But... Uh, they came along and they had to finish up and they had to dig me out of it, you know. But they, they, got, they got me out of the lamps and say, because the, the gas, the fumes of the thing was kind of choking me. Our conditions on the job were, were pretty rough, like as I think any of us could say that, that we worked in that time. My last job actually down in Shannon, we were working at Shannon Airport across from, from the main terminal, working on the River Shannon and uh, the wind coming off, that was unbearable. And like for like just for restrooms and bathrooms, it was I was like a sheet of sheet of plastic, and I was like it was pretty chilly. Like and uh. you see, a toilet at that stage was was non-existent. The the uh, a toilet at that stage was a was a, a, a galvanized structure. You know, a hole dug in the ground, right, and a few sheets of galvanized erected around it, right, and there'd be a, a plank would be a, a, a sprung across the, the the hole in the ground. And that would be the toilet, you know, at the end of the church. There was all sorts of things went down. They cut the, they cut the plank and everything, you see, Jesus across and you know, once or twice fellas fell into the into <laughs> into, into the hole. And I would say it was one of the roughest trees in the building line, like outside the general operative now, like that was, you know, the um, hail and rain and then mucking slush, like, you know, it was really uh, Especially when you go into a building site there you now for the first time in a building like there's nothing there only they dig a big hole in the ground for to put in a 
the toilet and then the cement shed in like in Ruff, you had no you had no um water gear or nothing like that. No helmets at the time or nothing. Yeah. You have no footwear, no no uh, safety footwear or nothing. Yeah. Things were hard, like that difficult, you know. Wages were very small, as you said, uh, two, two pence an hour. That was around seven shillings and ten pence a week. That second year, they went up double that, fifteen and eight. That's four pence an hour. So uh, things were, you know, much difficult. The wages were little, very little that time, like compared with now, you see. You know, builders were very slow here to provide a canteen for workers. The uh, most fellas, right, for their 10 o'clock tea and the lunch break, right, it would be, you would have it in the cement shed if it was raining. If it was fine, you would have it outside. But in the cement shed was about the nearest you got to a covered canteen. I, I, I always start from do pipe laying there and you'd have to use your fingers and you didn't have rubber gloves or anything like that. And you'd come home at night there and the tops of your fingers would be burned, little, little holes in them that you would be... You know, you touch anything there, you could feel the pain, like, you know, it's a... Your knuckles and, oh, God, you'd be in pieces, like there was no such thing as gloves for your hands at time, like. Yeah, well, the the, the conditions were, were uh, when I was having my time and going into the, the just coming out of the apprenticeship, uh, uh, it was, I, I thought it was kind of rough enough, you know, to, uh, looking back on the... On today's uh, stuff they have now and all these, these lifts and uh, elevators and cranes and stuff. It was just basically planks and stuff put together and battles, one battle up on top of another and a few planks up on top of that and that's where they were building their houses. It had its um, its good points and bad points, mainly in the winter was a bad time and in the summer you'd make up for it, you know, you'd, you would have the shirt off and get the tan and all that kind of thing. I met a lot of good masons and bricklayers through my father and I always liked the way they talked and got along and stuff and I liked, come, I liked the uh, brotherhood of it a lot. They all looked after me, all the lads there, they were a great bunch of men like, you know, I had, they were always standing like, you know, I could, uh, you know, I could say nothing against them like, they were a great bunch like. Yeah, they definitely looked after the, the apprentice, I yeah. Well, we were handy, we go for the pub, get an organ in the port or something, it was special in the Monday. <laughs> Some of them were very loyal and very honourable because I remember when I went working with Paddy Philpott first and we were doing houses up in the top of Grange, as I said, and we had a price in for the houses anyway, and with that, by God, the next thing was, we were start, we were to start together on the Monday. And as it so happened, over the weekend I got the flu and I was inside in bed. I couldn't go to work. And with that, by God, Paddy called and... Betty, God be merciful to my wife, she said, Paddy, she was inside in bed, you're dying with the flu. I was inside in bed anyway for maybe the best part of the week. And next I walked, and of a Friday evening, you know, I was after falling asleep during the day, and I woke. And next the wife said to me, Paddy, Phil Paddy, was here, she, he wouldn't let me wake up. So with that, got, and so she, he left that day for you, he left what the I? So I opened it, my wages. Now he didn't know what class of a person I was. He left me wages, first week, you know. And these are things like that you will, you will always remember and uh, appreciate, if you like. Sorry, Mark. Yes, Lubbers and the Custer. Sorry, Baru. Through whole tish. Well, you'd hear it now, there. Like I, I wouldn't even have a word of it, but. Um, I'd hear them speaking it, and it was like, you know, what are they talking about you'll be saying to yourself? You wouldn't understand the word of it. Like like someone speaking Italian or, or uh, Spanish to me you now, like, you know, but I knew it was their own language, and they could talk away and you about you, and you wouldn't even know what they're saying. So then I've been working then with a man, Tom Madden, God be merciful to him. Just he taught me the bell log, because... Every word that he'd say was bare log nearly, and I'd say, what is that, Mr. Madden? And then he'd say, look, boy. And then he'd say whatever he had been saying to me in our own language, let's put it that way. So the, uh, when, you, when you went to work, then you'd, you just kind of automatically listened, you know, and you would hear spattles of it. The, uh, and uh, 
they, you would hear men, the men in there, especially if they didn't want somebody else to hear what they were saying, if it was a bit of a secret, they'd, they'd say like, uh, show room, mark, the, 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 the language was there, you know, was that, um, you know, that uh, every mason was called Mako Lake, you know, you know, you know, you Mako and all that lake. Show room the boo now, like, that was, uh, have a look at the beautiful woman coming up here, yeah? show room to the boo Mak, you know, like, uh, Mak was the mason, Mak, there was the college of the lake, you know, and Mako, hey Mako, you know. And when we say, how's the boo getting on, that was the wife, you know, and, uh, and that lake, you know, and... Uh, it was cast as a gabby issue at that time, right? and uh, there was different walls like that, you see, the Boraboo, and, uh, you know, if you were, I got interested in all those things too, like, you know. And the prince was a gabby ish he gave them the gabbo. <laughs> <laughs> no, she wasn't the prince, they were gabbos, we were gabby -ishes. And the wife then was a boo, and the other officer, Call here to be no the, 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 the boy was coming. My name's language was the, the the wife was coming. All families, right, had a knowledge, right, of the trade. Because it would be talked about at home in your house and everything. Some of the old wives, right? They because they were they were so so involved and they had to be it because they their their husbands and their fathers and their brothers and everything, they were a, they were a, they were involved in the in, in the trade as much as anybody, and the uh, uh, they they would they would they would know bits and pieces of, of the bear log, and they could spatter an old wart here and there. My grandmother, God be merciful to her, she could speak the bear log because my father taught it to her, I suppose. And at one stage, uh, my father was down inside in Douglas Street. I think it was in the church. I think that was the name of the pub. And the masons used to go there after their meetings, they'd all go for a drink over to Douglas Street, those that did drink. And they were inside in the, inside in the bar anyway, and my grandmother happened to be inside in the snug, you see? And with the God, the masons were chatting away, and there was some, the bar's made, she must have been a fine half, as we say, you know? And with that big God, next time anyway, one, one mason said to the other fella, my God, Marco, he said, that's a fine boo there, he said, I wouldn't mind having to go through off of that, or cause through to ling with it, you know. So with that, my grandmother was inside, she heard what your man said, you see. And with that, because she stood up from where she was, and there was a small little door in the snug, she had a small little window for handing out the drinks, and she put her head in through the window, in through this opening, and she said, come here, Marco, that, that boo is but a boo, boy, you can get no good through there, she said to him. And what that meant was, he was after saying to the lads, he said, by God, he said he wouldn't mind having to go off her and say in bed, you know. And with that, the grandmother said, you can't have nothing off her, boy. She said, she's a mad boomer. Where money was concerned now, they were called pine cures. They'd say, like, what, 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 uh, how are the pine cures? That was, how is the money here? And they might say, that, that ish, that, um, that abbey there, is getting more pine cures than you are, so he's getting more money than you, you see, and then you went and looked for the same as him. When I started working in the fort, it, it was actually dying out then as such. But the, the, the qualified craftsmen, they had their own way of speaking to each other, that you would not just say, which is bad luck, you see, right? No, you, you pick up phrases, like how he acted, did we know? My mother was saying, show all the loader, look at the work. The only, I think the only word that kind of lived on, right, uh, from the days of the Balag was uh, mock. And mock was, was half Irish, half Balag, because mock, right, was, was, was the son, right? But the, uh, when, the, when the Masons would be referring to mock, right, it, could, it would be butty, or it would be son, right, or uh, it would be friend, you know. The, uh, that, would, uh, that was the one, that's about the only word I'd say that lived on, 
right, in uh, uh, since olden times. You'd hear little bits of it, like through hold the Benu, and you know, but being a young lad at the time, it, it was the furthest thing from my mind. To me, like it was, you know, it was a, a completely different language. It was like to try to learn Irish, you know. Well, it's it's not spoken today. It's died out, I'd say, since about the very early fifties, when when um, when the when the foreman was not when the foreman was not respected on the job, they went to the builder and made their own deals, right? And then the barlog was it just died out. Him. Well, I won't say what I said, <laughs> but I just no, uh, what I, was, for, have a look at the woman. What I said <coughs> first of all was, look out, the the the, the bus is coming. It was the foundation on the Black Ark Church. I worked in the Valley Free Hand Church. I worked uh, as an apprentice there as a shoddy assistant. I went in there to uh, opposite the, the courthouse there. I think it belonged to, uh, at the time, was it Mosgraves? Was it that building there, a brick building there. I, I don't know who was there now, but I worked on that and repairing the brickwork there and the gable ends, you know. And you'd, you, you'd pass at the bus now and you'd look up there and you'd say, God, I remember that time I was up there on the scaffold there, <laughs> walking on that. But these are little tarts there, we've got two young men. We'd done the North Press there now in, uh, in uh, Joel Griffin Street years ago, I was only a young lad like. And I often said to the lads when I passed in there, I walked in there, it's a lovely building. This building was built by my great grandfather. It is nice, but it was to the test of time. I mean, they took a bit of cutting with a hammer and a scissor. My best pride would be the UCC, the bowl I've been paving there. There are so many different panels and so forth. I was the first person to um, pedestrianise Princess Street. Uh, Balfour Hand Church, which I worked on myself a little bit before I went to America. I suppose as long as you will have building and, 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 and structures right, being erected, right, you'll have you'll have the trade. There's good work being done. Oh, but there is definitely good good work being done around the city, as you say. But I'd say if you went out into where there's houses and factories and things like that being built, I'd say it has been scabbed all over the place. I would imagine. Do you know all the grand buildings that we have in Cork and grand frontages, right? And with the last oh God, forty years anyway, right? less maybe, right? The architects, modern architects to me, right, only learn to draw straight lines. They never learn to draw a circle line, right? So the, you only had all square boxes, right, uh, design as uh, as for any kind of buildings. And into that then they'd tap a pane of glass. Concrete jungles and glass, that's all there. But if you go over to, to the corner of Anglesey Street, by the some family hospitals, a job done there, and to the knees, a job of brick, I've seen them for a long, long, long time, if you ask. Building materials got expensive. You see, stone you can't get, you'd have to import it. Right? Bricks, right, is, 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 are, are expensive. Right? So, the simplest thing is to put up two metal structures, two metal girders, right, and put a piano glass in between them. Right? And fill the sides then with mastic. You know, as, as Paddy Madden would have said, it was gab luder which meant it was bad work. When Miss Foster used to see all these glass towers, this Elysian thing. Do you know, uh, John Storrs and Patrick Street, mm -hmm. uh, the Opera House. So it's, 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 it's like a glass house, you go out to Madden's there. And you find that today, that the developers, they've, they've decided that there's no need for quality anymore, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, any man to stick a big tower, like that Elysian tower, in the middle of two of the most beautiful buildings, facing one another. I, I can't fathom that at all. And, and whoever the planning officer was that gave plans for that. I mean, this building now is just like a white elephant. It's empty, sitting there, doing nothing, only fucking looking gormless. The architect that the, that the, 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 the Cock Corporation engaged there recently, right, to redesign the city. Right, I have a terrible problem with that one. And I'd love to meet her sometime, right, and sit down and have a chat with her. And when I saw then what she provided, right, for seating areas, right, big lumps of stone, right, or concrete, right, as seats, 
place at me as if no God help us. That girl now has a lot to love him because she came from sunny Spain where they have 11 months of the year right, where you are roasted right, by the weather right, and, you, and everything is fine and dry right, and you can sit down on it. But you come to Cox City where we have 11 months of the year where we are swamped out with water right, and the seats are drowned wet and who the Jesus are going to sit on wet seats because right, we were always taught long ago in the building by the older men that went before us that if you were sitting down on a concrete block either put your cap on there or put a bit of newspaper in, on there because you will get poils right and I said when I saw this I said well Jesus you know half a cock will have poils one of these years right and the hospital won't be able to hold us right so that, that was that, that was something else. I said I'd love to meet her sometime and have a chat about this and say listen would you ever think and remember that is in Cox City you are right Right, and not in sunny Spain. This happened down, down in North Cork. And uh, like that now, they were building a church, so he's the local builder. And anyway, he, uh, he was looking for men, of course, and of course you couldn't pick up the, the stone boys. They'd be, very, they'd be taken up and they wouldn't be hanging around anyway, but Anyway, he got some, and he was after falling over this good, good man, good stone basin, and he wouldn't imply him no more, you see. But he got pressure from the architect and from the, the canon of the church, and anyway, he had to imply the man that he sacked and wouldn't imply him again, but he was the good sort, you see. So we got in anyway, they had a meeting this day, the architect and the canon and the bishop, the, the, the bishop of Francis and all that, and they went down to the church, look at it. And God mighty, they, when he implied the ladder, he didn't want to imply the good man. He put him at the back of the church, you see, and he left, he, he started building at the back, but then he had his own cronies out in the front. So we got an anyway inspection, well, a visit from the, and anyway they, they weren't a bit pleased with the, the work at the front of the church. And one of the lads was around there and he went back and told the, the old Gabon at the back, the good mason, and uh, he told him the story. So we got you know, anyway, uh, he was going to have the crack off the builder. So he walked along to the, the front and they were all debating about the stone and then so he went over and he tapped the air right? Come here, sir, he says. Come round to the back, he says, and I'll show you the front. <laughs> it was his work, you see. When you would look back at times at the uh, some of the buildings, you know, that had been erected and built, right, with this type of scaffolding, you would have to say to you, Jesus, they were marvellous, marvellous men. The, and, 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 and you look, and a good example of it is, is St. Augustine's Church. If you ever stand in Washington Street and look at St. Augustine's Church and look at the size of the stone that are up there, you know, and that was, that was built you now I, 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 off of timber spare scaffolding. You say, how did they get them up there? You know, the marvellous, marvellous uh, operations. Mm -hmm. And my father had a great saying as well, you know, he used to say, you know, it's better to be sacked for to be slow and good than to be sacked for bad work. And he used to say there's a lot of builders, there's only a handful of builders. In 1963 there wasn't a great amount of builders around. And he used to say, well, you know, Cork is a very small place and it's very, very easy to get a bad name and very hard to get a good one. So he said, if you get a bad name around the town, it'll travel like welfare. So that's the one thing you don't want to do. You do your work right. The workmanship um, I've seen in Cork is, is, is uh, I'd say it's the best. I've been in work all over America. I've never seen stonework, in, um, especially the stonework in Cork is excellent. When the trades did open and every man's son deserves a chance. But when they did open, I think that uh, a lot of the families um, they, they hadn't as much to say with the union, they hadn't as much pull or power, they lost kind of the camaraderie that I think that they should have and that they did have. 
they open the floodgates, left in every Tom, Dick and Harry, as the saying goes, and then, as the saying goes, prices of them were dropping away down and work was being prostituted. In other words, it was only just being fired up and just grab the money and run. No, that started, I suppose, around the time when I was just finished my apprenticeship. And uh, it took a while to get a hold, but once you got a hold then, is that the subcontractor was the only person that the builder had to deal with. The subcontractor hired all the men, and at that time then you would be paid your rate of pay still, and they'd put you on bonus. So basically your, your week's wages was always there, and your, your, your wet time at that time would be there, but you'd get extra money for the more blocks you put in. But you'd still be covered like, you know, for your week's wages no matter what happened. So that started changing then, whereby the, the, the subcontractor decided, well, you know, why should I give him that? I'd only just give him whatever he earns per block that he lays. Of course, since then, it is all the, the go. So here's the best of God, no? I'd say it's much different now today, really, because uh, use the, the likes of us, we had a real interest like, in what they were doing, but no, I'd say, you know, there was only a haphazard way like, of, of uh, picking up the trade. I, I enjoyed what I was doing, and I took great interest in what I was doing, and the money didn't come into it. They really don't have time to, for the crack and, uh, and um, to pass on knowledge on, on to apprentices now, so I think a lot of them are losing out on that, you know. The pride has gone over the trade now in the 80s. Them the same pride as dad, down boy. That's him, we're, we're proud, proud of your trade, but there's too much money involved in it. Everything is uh, so fast and everything is on price. You don't have really time to teach the apprentices, you know. It is all hurry, hurry and get this done. If they can't get it done, they're losing money. Anybody that's working in the present moment, they haven't time to teach a youngster. And a lot of it like results in shoddy work to say along the way that they wouldn't have maybe the pride in it for the reason why they weren't shown properly. And I know the apprenticeships are down to say four years now. There was a reason for why we done seven years. It wasn't for the good of our health anyway, uh, for the money we were getting. I started off, I was getting one pound and ten shillings a week for 44 hours. One pound and ten shillings. When the young was up the road, I walked in the, that, that, that I used to hang around with on the street, were walking in factories and they were getting seven pounds a week. And my mother put up with getting one pound and ten shillings from me every week until I came out of my time. And my father said to me one time, he says, I always remember, son, he said, you won't be always getting one pound and ten shillings. Because I, I wanted to get out of the trade because I, wasn't get, I was going over a girl and I wanted to be able to, you know, flamouse the girl and show that I could spend things too. <laughs> and he said, you won't be always getting one pound and ten shillings, he said. But he said, the man up, the uncle up the road there is getting seven pounds inside in the shoe factory down the road, he says, he'll always be getting seven pounds. And he was true. I came out there afterwards. And I'd done very well for myself and I travelled the world and I worked with, 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 with some great tradesmen. Um, you know, the union was very strong. There was no, supposed to be no lumping fellas did it and worked on price. It was a pity like that when pricing did come in then, around 1954, I suppose, roughly around that time, that pricing really started to come in and they were doing fourpence per block. Every block you do, you get fourpence for it. And the only way that some of them could price it was when they'd put up the line, the four pence, eight pence, above, one of four. We talk about, um, you know, getting up work fast. I walk with this, this man, and he was a subcontractor, and he said to me, he said, when you're on block and flat now, Joe, he said, spread away, spread away, spread away, right? And get the blocks in, get the blocks in. So, I mean, I was only eight months in the trade, so I was down Mill Street in the school in Mill Street for Sisk anyway, and I, I, I ended up with this elderly man. He was calling the Screw Falvey. He was Peter Falvey's father at the time, and um, I didn't know he was Peter Falvey's father, but the, the, your man said to me, he said, he's Screw Falvey. He was an old stone, an old mace, an old hand, and he was on one end of the line, right, and the block and flat, and I was up there, oh, just was about, it was 40 blocks long, and um, of course, I'd done what I was told to do, I spread the bed anyway all the way along for the for the later blocks and when I got up to him he says to me, young man, what do you think you're doing? 
soft-spoken guy, and he says, what do you think you're doing? And I said, I'm spreading for, for, for the blocks. So he says, you're spreading for blocks. He says, do you know something, he says, that's a mighty block, he says, you're going to lay there. He says, who's going to lift that block with you? Right? So he came up, he fired all the stuff off the wall. I'm looking at him and he's throwing all the stuff off the wall. And he says to me, you can only lay one block at a time. So you spread for one block and you lay one block. You spread for the next block and you lay the other block, he says. And you ever do that again, he says, you won't be on this wall with me anymore. These are the people that we had in our company that the young flow there today don't have. Had they, not, had they kept the, con- the subcontractors out, they could have named their own rates. Work was so plentiful. Unfortunately, the people today, don't, they don't care. They see an old man in the street and they say, well, you know, an old man, so he's a hindrance because you have to help him onto the bus or you have to, you have to get him to across the road. But no one looks deeper to see what was he, you know, where did he come from, what was, what was his life. There was always room for an elderly mason. There always made room for, for an elderly mason in a job. They'd fit him in something. And, and rightly so, and it should still be done today. For, I mean, some people aren't good at everything, but there's a job for everyone. If I had a young family at the present moment, I'd, I'd be very concerned about how, what they're going to do in life. And they all can't become doctors and brain surgeons and such. I mean, so you, you engineers, architects, they don't have jobs in super value at the present moment. The trade, there's still some very good tradesmen out there. There's some of them that came in that their fathers never served their time are excellent. This stone is done by hand, dressed, squared and everything by hand, by chisel and hammer. And it's not guillotined, like what they're selling today now. It's all guillotine stuff. It's all done and put into bags and sent down and any old guy could put it together then. But this... This is what we're talking about. This is what we were taught down through the years, you know, generations. And this is, and this is what I'm saying. This is what the youngsters are lacking today. They're not getting taught this, and they should be taught this. And the people like Jim and, and, and the rest of our families that, that can do this should be, before they pass on, should be able to pass this on to other people to be able to do it. To be a pleasure to go along and say, you've done that. In a hundred years from now, when people come along and say, who built that? Oh, Jim Fahey done that, and he done it with his hands. Just a hammer and chisel in the, in, the, in the beautiful. You go back and look at work and say to yourself, you're sitting in a car one day at 60 years of age and someone says, geez, that beautiful black work or brick work or stone work there. And you turn around and say, oh, you done that. Or to be sitting in a car and if I come along and say, Jesus, who built that thing? And you say, Jesus, it is bad, all right, isn't it? And you know yourself, you built it. Do you know what I mean? This is the quality and quantity where the quality and quantity comes in again. And that's quality. There's no quantity there. I wouldn't like to say how long it's gone on for now, but that's... Uh, that's <laughs> <laughs> well, she's not there, I'm going to get it in for her. <laughs> today, no, it's a doggy dog today out there. I know with the way the recession is, I know, I'd say, it must be desperate altogether. But well, thanks be to God, I'm out of it anyway. And I, what I would say to any young fellow coming along today, forget your speed, get the work right first, and the speed will automatically come along after I'll be quite honest, I think this, uh, our trade is turning into a trade for hen- handymen. There are things lost today now which was in the building line, but we were making too much money to bother to do it. And then it was lost. And it lasts forever. The work has been dumbed down each and every day. They're trying to find a way to shorten uh, the procedure to do a craft. We have a man there now with the last statue maker in Cork, Morris O'Donnell. Uh, this man always probably going out of business because, well, I suppose, first of all, there's no one there to take over, but after that then, you have statues being brought in from, from probably China and places like that where they're mass-produced by cheap labour. I think I'm the last of the statue makers. There was three statue makers in Dublin. There was one in Limerick, a fellow by the name of Boosley, and there was Bernardi's and in Cork. Yeah. And um, that was it. Myself, like I, I worked for the Bernardis all the years, and I carried on from them, you know. So that was the end. I don't think there'll be any more statue makers after me. <laughs> uh, this is the first time in the last in the Mohicans. <laughs> I 
I'm the moving statue. They're very slow moving on their mothers. They're very slow moving over here. So, like, looking back, looking back, I really enjoyed my time, serving my time as a mason up to the time I finished. And really, I suppose if I had my time over me again, I wouldn't change what I'd done. I really liked what I'd done. Whilst I was in the building line, I loved every day of it. It was a joy to get in in the morning. We had a ball, we had a crack, there were different things being done. It was come out of them ourselves. No, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't swap for anything, really, like, no, no. No, I met some great friends there, like. I mean, when I got into this thing of chasing up the history of the, the trade union and the Masons in Cork, I got to meet some of the nicest people that I've ever met in my life. When I left it, when I, when I retired, I really missed it. And I'm not saying I missed it because of the work or because of the money or anything else. It was the comradeship. You got up in the morning and you knew you were going to meet Jim Fahey, Eddie Bryan, Dennis Murphy or something. And you were going to have a bit of a crack or oh, Aldea with him. Dennis Kidney you know, and all that all together. You were going to have a crack with him. And it was then you missed that. That's what you missed. So I'd say once you get into your blood, I'd say that's it. There's nothing else you could do. Well, my name is Con Fahey, I'm a mason And I've served up me time at the old trade And I walked with me father and brothers We were journeymen plying our trade Wet me in ting of an inting of an idol Wet me in ting of an inting of an idol with me robo bo ro bo bo and me troll it keeps spreading away. Well, these forty long years we have travelled, all by the contents of our sack, our hammers, our chisels and plumb bob. Shall we carry them all on our back? Wet me in ting of an in ting of an idol. With me in ting of an in ting of an idea, with me robo bo robo bo and me troll it keeps spreading away. Well, we walked on St. Finbar's and Coleman's, and we walked on the old women's jail. We drank Beamish and Morphy's and whiskey, and had pig's feet and bodies for tea. Wet me in ting of an in ting of an idol. With me in ting of an in ting of an idol. With me robo bo robo bo and me troll it keeps spreading away. There was talky fly paper and varnish. There's the blacker, the horse and gabon. There was Dooney and old Tombo Johnson. One rounder and papers as well. Wet me in ting of an in ting of an idol. With me in ting of an in ting of an idol. With me robo bo robo bo and And me troll it keeps spreading away. Well now that you've all turned to concrete. And your towers they're all made of glass. There's no longer those wrong towers of granite. Sure, we've left all of that in our past. With me in ting of an in ting of an idol. With me in ting of an in ting of an idol. With me robo bo robo bo and And me troll it keeps spreading away. Well, now I must go meet my maker. For a chapel he'll have me complete For the masons he brought up to do it Were all in the pub full of drink 
Wet me and ting of an inting of an idol. Wet me and ting of an inting of an idol. Wet me robo bo robo bo randy. And me troll it's not spreading today. Wet me and ting of an inting of an idol. Wet me and ting of an inting of an idol. With me robo bo robo bo randy. And me troll it's not spreading today.